Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Anna Mateo tells us about a college dance class that teaches students to dance like the famous Radio City Rockets. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Anna Mateo. College student Rhapsody Stiggers. Is one of 38 students at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley taking a dance class that is the first of its kind. Her teacher, Amarissa Labar, is a current member of the Radio City Rockets, a famous precision dance team in New York City. Stiggers has been dancing since she was two years old. She has taken many kinds of dance classes. However, the twenty-year-old has never had a dance class as difficult as this one. The class is the first four-credit college course taught by a rocket dancer. The dance instructor teaches the detailed, precise technique the rockets are known for. The dancers move and kick together in perfect time. Stiggers is skilled in dance forms, including ballet, modern, jazz, salsa, and West African. But she said that no other style of dance really emphasizes the precision of every single body part. She added that this high level of attention to precision. Makes this a very different dance class. Teacher Labar has been a rocket for about five years. She is twenty-five years old and started teaching at her mother's dance business at the age of sixteen. She finds sharing the rocket's style with college students intense. Teaching on a rocket level is completely different. And is a lot more difficult to do, because we really tune in to the perfection of our movement. Labar told the Associated Press. The Rockets use tap, ballet, and jazz forms in their dances. The class also teaches strength training and choreography. Dancers learn methods that can be used in many other kinds of dance. The class is not only difficult; it is also one of the most popular dance classes at the Performing Arts School. Places in the class fill up fast," said Myla Thigpen. She heads dance at the conservatory. The Rockets group is known for a yearly performance called the Christmas Spectacular. In that show, they perform one of their best-known moves: high kicking at exactly the same time. Dancing like a rocket not only requires precision; it requires hard work. Rockets rehearse six hours per day, six days a week. Another important requirement: students must love being part of a team. So, to be a rocket, first off, you have to have a love of wanting to work together as a team," said Julie Branham, who began her dancing career 36 years ago. She is director and choreographer of the Rockettes' show *Christmas Spectacular*. That show first performed in 1933. It is said that 69 million people have seen the Rockettes perform it over the years. To make sure every dancer moves the same, 
Everything the performers do is examined closely, Branham said. We are checking what 36 people do in that line over and over again. Is your head at the same angle? Is your arm at the same height? She added, so it's the willingness of wanting to work as one to make the effort of the 36 dancers look beautiful. The college level class is an extension of the Rockettes Dancer Development Program. Only promising dancers are invited. Rhapsody Stiggers has been very moved by the experience. In fact, one day she may try out for the Rockettes. She said, it is a fun goal to have. If I don't get in, she said, it's still useful knowledge that I've learned that can carry on into the rest of my career. I'm Ana Mateo. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has discovered new details about a huge grouping of galaxies known as Pandora's Cluster. The American Space Agency says Webb captured the new details in a single image with its powerful infrared instruments. The findings are expected to help astronomers learn new things about the development of galaxies and how they influence each other. Pandora's cluster is officially known as Abel 2744. NASA reports the cluster is believed to have formed from several smaller galaxy clusters over a period of about 350 million years. In the past, Pandora's cluster was observed by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. It has also been studied by the space agency's Chandra X-ray Observatory, as well as by several land-based telescopes that collected image and radio data. The cluster has long been an observational favorite of scientists because of its ability to magnify more distant galaxies. This happens because the combined mass of the galaxy clusters creates a powerful gravitational lens, NASA reports. This lens is created by a natural, magnifying effect of gravity. The process permits much more distant galaxies in the early universe to be observed by using the cluster like a magnifying glass, NASA says. The method permits scientists to observe structures from the early universe that may not otherwise be seen. The Hubble was only able to carry out detailed observations of Pandora's center. But NASA says Webb used the lensing method to observe multiple areas of the cluster. This resulted in never-before-seen details of Pandora, which includes galaxies of different ages, sizes, and shapes. Astronomers used Webb's infrared instruments together with the cluster's own gravitational lens to create a detailed image of more than 50,000 sightings of near-infrared light. Rachel Besenson is an astronomer with the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. She is also an investigator with the Uncover program, which seeks to use web observations to reach certain science goals. She said in a statement that when the new images of Pandora's cluster began to come in, she and other team members felt starstruck. There was so much detail in the foreground cluster and so many distant lensed galaxies, I found myself getting lost in the image, 
Besenson added, Webb exceeded our expectations. NASA said the team used Webb's near-infrared camera to observe Pandora's cluster with exposures lasting four to six hours. This resulted in a total observing time of about 30 hours. Astronomer Evo Lab is with Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. She is also an investigator on the Uncover program. Lab said the new web image clearly shows elements from hundreds of distant galaxies. When examined closely, the image suggests the existence of more and more galaxies within Pandora's cluster. The image, Lab added, showed a stronger, wider, deeper, and better lens than had ever been seen before. My first reaction to the image was that it was so beautiful. It looked like a galaxy formation simulation, she said. We had to remind ourselves that this was real data, and we are working in a new era of astronomy now. The researchers say the next step for them is to closely examine the imaging data and identify galaxies for follow-up observations with another web instrument. That instrument, the near-infrared spectrograph, aims to produce exact distance measurements. It is also designed to provide additional, detailed data on the different structures contained in Pandora's cluster. NASA says it plans to begin those web observations later this summer. The space agency noted that the latest data collected by Webb has been publicly released. This move is meant to help astronomers around the world use the valuable new data to plan their own scientific studies of Pandora's cluster. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, Brian Lynn joins me to talk more about this week's science report. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me, Ashley. This week's report dealt with a new discovery made by NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. The telescope used its high-tech instruments to provide new details about a large grouping of galaxies known as Pandora's Cluster. I know the report said this particular cluster had been studied before by scientists, so what led to the new discoveries this time around? So, yes, the astronomers carrying out the latest research completely credited the abilities of the Webb telescope for making these discoveries. Specifically, they said the telescope's infrared capabilities made it possible to provide more detailed information about the structures of Pandora's many different galaxies. And how does this differ from other technologies used by telescopes in the past? Well, in the case of Pandora's cluster, past observations were made by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. That telescope has been very effective for NASA in observing galaxies and groups of galaxies like Pandora. In fact, Hubble has served the space agency well for the past 30 years, but Hubble's instruments were specifically designed to capture light that can also be seen by the human eye. But the Webb telescope was built with infrared capabilities that can uncover elements that remain more hidden in space. And can you explain to our listeners how this technology is designed to work? Sure. So a basic explanation would be that Webb uses its instruments to observe infrared waves in space. It can identify these at a wavelength that is better for observing distant objects and, in fact, whole galaxy structures, like in this case, through the dense gas and dust that exists in space. 
So NASA says this is how the telescope is able to capture more in-depth data about the early development of the universe. And we've already seen the incredible images the web has been producing, and these represent the results of the telescope's work. And even the latest results we've been speaking about are also shown in a single colorful image. Okay. Thanks again for joining me on today's program, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. Morris Joyce and Frank Oliver continue the story of the man who served as America's twenty-second and twenty-fourth president, Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland began his second presidency in 1893. His two terms were separated by the presidency of Benjamin Harrison. Cleveland took office again, just as the United States was entering an economic depression. Businesses failed, banks closed their doors, workers lost their jobs, and farmers. Lost their farms. President Cleveland believed the depression was caused by the government's money policy. At that time, both gold and silver were used to support the value of the American dollar. In Europe, however, only gold was used. American investors and bankers were afraid their money would drop in value. Because of the use of silver, they began exchanging their money for gold. President Cleveland wanted to return to the gold standard too. To do this, he had to urge Congress to kill a law which forced the government to buy silver. Before Congress began its debate, the president discovered a cancer in his mouth. The cancer needed to be removed immediately, but the operation had to be kept secret. News that the president's life was in danger could have an effect on the debate. It could make the nation's economic crisis worse. So, the operation was done on a private boat in New York Harbor. Doctors removed some of President Cleveland's teeth, and much of his upper left jaw. Then they removed the cancer. The operation took only a half hour. After a few weeks, doctors made Cleveland a new jaw out of hard rubber. He wore it without difficulty. A newspaper printed a story about the operation. But administration officials denied it. The facts did not become public for many years. When President Cleveland returned to Washington, he sent a message to members of Congress. He urged them to kill the law which forced the government to buy silver. He noted how people throughout the nation had been exchanging their paper money and silver for gold. He said he was afraid the federal treasury would soon run out of gold. Then it would have only silver to support the dollar. If that happened, he said, the United States no longer could claim to be a major nation. President Cleveland said, "The people of the United States have a right to a money recognized as such." On every exchange and in every market of the world, their government has no right to injure them by financial experiments that are opposed to the policies of other nations. After the president's message was read, the House of Representatives began its debate. A young congressman from Nebraska spoke in opposition. To the president's position, his part in the debate made him famous throughout the nation. His name was William Jennings Bryan. 
Brian said the United States should continue to make and use both gold and silver money. Using only gold, he said, increased the value of the dollar, and that made life difficult for America's farmers and workers. They had to pay more to borrow money, and for farmers, a more valuable dollar meant lower prices for crops. Bryan described the situation this way. On one side of the debate stand the business interests of the United States. On the other side stand the unnumbered masses. Work-worn and covered with dust, they make their appeal. But too often, their cry for help has sounded hopelessly against the outer walls, while others, less deserving, find easy entrance to the halls of Congress. The President is wrong to act on the demand of the business interests. He can no more judge the wishes of the great mass of our people by the words of these middlemen than he can measure the ocean's silent depths by the foam upon its waves. No other congressman spoke as well as William Jennings Bryan, yet his words could not save the Silver Purchase Law. The House of Representatives approved President Cleveland's proposal to kill the law. The Senate did, too. The United States was firmly on the gold standard. Everyone, especially President Cleveland, waited for the economy to improve. It did not. More businesses failed. More workers lost their jobs. Tens of thousands of men left their homes to look for work. Some of these men began to unite in protest groups they called industrial armies. One industrial army was organized by a man named Jacob Coxey. Coxey proposed that the federal government should hire unemployed men to build roads. He said the government could borrow enough money to pay each man a dollar and a half a day. Coxey decided to take his proposal to Washington. He also decided to take his industrial army with him. Coxey's army marched many kilometers from Ohio to Washington. Hundreds of unemployed men joined in along the way. But by the time the army reached the capital, only 300 men remained. City officials barred Coxey's army from meeting on public property. They barred them from asking people for food or money. Jacob Coxey was ready for the worst. He said, If my men starve in the streets of Washington, the smell of their bodies will force Congress to act. Coxey tried to read a protest statement at the Capitol building. Police stopped him. The protesters then pushed forward in what police later called a riot. Several of the men, including Coxey, were arrested. A judge found Coxey guilty of violating public property. He sent him to jail for 20 days. Without Coxey's leadership, his army broke up. Its members went home. Yet the economic and social pressures which created Coxey's army did not ease Protests and strikes continued throughout the nation. The biggest strike started in Chicago against the Pullman Company, which made railroad cars. The man who owned the company, George Pullman, 
also owned the town where his workers lived. He owned the stores, the houses, the schools, and the library. When the economic depression began in 1893, George Pullman cut the size of his workforce. Those still working received less pay, yet Pullman did not reduce the cost of rent for his houses. Anyone who protested lost his job. In the spring of 1894, a labor union organizer went to George Pullman's town. He was Eugene Debs, leader of the American Railway Union. Pullman did not want his workers to belong to a union, but he did not stop them at first. More than 4,000 workers joined. Immediately, the new union members voted to go on strike against the Pullman Company. Other members of the union supported them. They agreed not to work on trains that included Pullman cars. Within a few days, 60,000 railway workers were on strike. Twenty railroads were closed down. Union leader Eugene Debs attempted to keep the strike peaceful, but he could not control strikers all over the country. So railroad companies asked the federal government for troops to break the strike. The request involved a legal point. America's Constitution says federal troops cannot be sent to a state unless the state government asks for them, and no state government had asked for them. President Cleveland met with his cabinet to discuss the railroad company's request. They finally agreed to send federal troops to Chicago, where the strike had started, to enforce federal postal laws. The troops would protect trains carrying mail. The arrival of the troops led to more violence. Eugene Debs and other leaders of the American Railway Union were arrested. The Pullman strike ended. President Cleveland faced increasing political problems. Organized labor denounced him for using federal troops to break up the Pullman strike. Farmers and Westerners attacked him for opposing the use of silver money. And everyone blamed him for not doing more to end the Depression these political problems would have a great effect on the next presidential election. 